Hi everyone and welcome to a rather special Blitz review on this occasion. This is Eternal Palace from Alley Cat Games and it's not been released yet because it is due to come out on Kickstarter I believe on the 8th of March 2021. As you may know I don't tend to do previews of Kickstarter games unless I'm very very choosy on the subject. On this occasion a few things intrigued me about the game which I'll get onto in more detail but suffice to say that this is a pre-Kickstarter copy of the game so I won't be talking too much about component quality in this, although I can at least talk about the artwork, which is for the pretty much final copies. But also, I have to stress that I have only played this as a two, three, and four player game, and I have not given this as many plays as I could do with a full review, mainly because I have limited components, and obviously we're still in lockdown, and there's no official like TTS mod that's public. So bear with me on that. But I will be giving my opinion on the game in question, and talking over how the game plays and what exactly it is. To give an overview of the mechanics, Eternal Palace is a lightweight dice placement game, and yes I know the genre is kind of bloated with this at the moment, but stick with me. Here you are rolling dice and using them in order to go on various locations numbered 1 to 12. Normally in these dice placement games you roll a single die and then depending on where it is on the board like 1 to 6, you go to any space you want and then the die value dictates how powerful the action is. This is not quite the case here, it's more similar to another game called Kingsburg, where you roll the dice and by totaling up the values of the dice, they allow you to go to the locations numbered 1 to 12. So a single die of 1 can go to the 1 location, but you could combine a 5 and a 3 to make 8 and go to the 8, you'd need two 6s to make a 12, you could combine four 3s to make the 12. You know, you can do whatever combination you like, and typically you will start the game with three dice, but you are able to pick up two more during the game, and you will always end up with your five by the end. There is essentially a, a way to get dice quicker than other players, but there's also a catch-up mechanism to ensure that you're not left with like much less dice than everybody else by the end. But it's a very straightforward like objective that you're going for. You've got various monuments that you can build, and by leveling up the tracks which involves going to the location multiple times, you are able to reach the top and get these painting pieces. These painting pieces, along with the monuments, are basically where victory points at the end of the game. And the first one to get up the track can get feature painting pieces, which are additional VPs, but also just additional little painting bits like that, like a little statue here. But for the most part, you're talking panoramic like backdrops. So a nice little uh, lake here, a mountainside here, some you know rivers and lakes. Basically, very nice looking artwork. And the idea is that you will go to these spaces, you will use up all your dice, you'll block other players, but not out of the location entirely. You can spend fish tokens in order to go to the location if someone else is already there, including yourself in fact. But you can also spend these wisdom tokens in order to augment your die value. One token allows you to plus or minus one, but changing it from a one to a six and vice versa would cost you two. So there is a decent amount of luck mitigation in this game, and there's a lot of different locations to go to, but certainly when you add more players to the game, it's going to get pretty tight. Most of the locations will gain you various resources. You've got wood, stone, kaolin, which is kind of a bit like a clay, I've been told, and bronze as well. And these can be used to build the various monuments that can get you VP, but you can also gain the wisdom tokens and the fish tokens as previously mentioned. Additionally, you are also able to acquire cards. These cards are basically like individuals and leaders within China. And these give you special abilities. They can be immediate one-off abilities, like to immediately gain favor, to level up a favor track, or to immediately gain resources. But they can also have once per round abilities, like for example, I can turn a fish into a wisdom token. You know, nice little simple things like that. Additionally, you also have ones where you can gain resources if you gift to other players. The game continues round after round until a certain amount of these painting pieces have been acquired by players and at that point you simply total up the victory points from all the paintings and the monuments and the, the favour track as well and then whoever has the most is the winner. Of course! The game boasts 1 to 5 players and 60 to 90 minutes on the timer. The timer is actually pretty accurate. A 2 player game, especially for your first one, probably will take you about an hour. But you could probably get it down to 45 minutes if you're very quick, but really I would allocate about an hour for this game. And then with each additional player, you're kind of adding an extra quarter of an hour, 20 minutes max for the player, so 60 to 90 minutes is perfectly doable. Now bear in mind I have only played this 2, 3 and 4 player. Uh, I don't have the rules for solo mode, so I can't comment on that, and I have not played this with 5. Personally though, I don't think I would want to play this with 5. 5 is right out! 
When you get to four players, this board gets very crowded. I mean, four players rolling dice and going on the various locations and leveling up tracks, there's a lot of competition for these. And I just think a fifth player would add just that bit too much extra time and uh, extra, like, too much stress with trying to go to these locations that it probably wouldn't warrant a play from me. But as I say, you've got the option there. But personally, I think this is better as a two, three, and four player game for now. And certainly the board doesn't scale, which is a slight issue. You don't necessarily have like a, a restricted board for two players compared to four players at this point in time. So maybe they can throw something in to scale it a bit better for player count. But otherwise, like I say, you just have to accept that maybe a two player game, you're going to be a little bit more free flowing with the locations. Whereas with more players, it's going to get more congested and more stressed. So even though I can't talk about the component quality as such, because this is a pre-Kickstarter copy and no doubt Alley Cat Games, being Alley Cat Games, will no doubt have a retail and a deluxe upgrade version. I will bet money on that. <laughs> they have not told me this, but you know what their other Kickstarters have been like and uh, yeah, I'm sure it will happen with this one. But to be honest, the components in here are pretty decent already. I mean, mainly from an artwork perspective. You have got very chunky wooden pieces for the resources, which is all well and good, but for the most part, it's all about the art. The art is very colorful, it's very striking, and the graphic design is easy to read on the board as well as on the cards themselves. Most of these cards are very intuitive in terms of what their abilities do, and if you're not entirely certain what one icon happens to mean, there'll be, you know, a, a reference in the rule book to explain it to you. But honestly, I didn't have a problem understanding 95% of these cards as they were coming up during plays. But the art is very cool. You know, if anything, the only nitpick I have with it though is that uh, when it comes to the characters, a lot of them look like they've got chiseled jawlines because it's like very straight line style art. But like I said, that's a very minor nitpick. Otherwise, I'm looking at this and going, ooh, this is beautiful. Add to that these really cool painting pieces that you have with this uh, canvas that you have, which is one of the most fun gimmicks I've ever seen thrown into a board game. It is a complete gimmick. When you get the painting pieces, they're worth the VP. That's it. You've got it, it's worth the VP, and you could just happily chuck it aside and go, but well, there's my VP, I'm done. But what they give you is essentially a canvas sheet where you can put these little landscape things on there and start creating little backdrops. I know you won't be able to see it on the camera that well, but I'll try and get some photos, but I can put like a mountain drop there, and maybe I'll put this uh, lake one overlapping it, and then I'll put this uh, nice little greenery here, so the greenery is at the bottom and then the mountains are in the background, and then I've got a couple of features. Well, okay, maybe I'll put this uh, temple behind there. There we go, a nice temple will overlap there, and we could put this uh, uh, lion statue or whatever it is in the corner, and you just basically create your own little picture. But it makes no difference to the scoring, you just do it for a bit of fun. And I guarantee you, I've already done this, and I know other people will, if you're worried about downtime in this game, don't be. Because if you sorted out what you're doing on your turn and you're just waiting for another player, I guarantee somebody, me included, is just going to be there going, mm, no, uh, uh, no, don't want that. Oh, ooh, yeah, put this down. Oh. Oh, it's a fun gimmick, but it is a gimmick. You know, just bear that one in mind. You know, but like I say, it's an extra mile that they've gone just to throw a little bit of extra immersion into the game. And I approve. I approve. Because I know a lot of people who are going to get really sort of addicted to creating these little art pieces. So far from my plays, this goes a long way to satisfying what I like in some of these games where you can get a low complexity to high depth ratio. The rules to this are very straightforward. As I said, I can compare it to Kingsburg. It's a very light dice placement game. There's not a huge amount of rules to do. And I didn't find there was any rules that I found particularly fiddly. Or weird to understand even the cards were pretty intuitive and then on top of that you do have a bit of depth in this game because it, yes the monuments are essentially the same and there's only so many different things you're aiming for but the fact that there's a lot of good luck mitigation in this game either from card abilities or from the wisdom tokens and the fish tokens there's a lot of flexibility in your turn to change what your original plan was based on where other players go but also behind your screen you've got that very hard decision to make of right i've rolled my dice but now how do i group them six five six three three what am I going to do with that? I mean, I could go to the 12, but then I could make that an 8. I could go to the 6 location twice, go to the 3. Maybe I'll combine them all. That's like, ooh, what do I do? And you've only got so much time to do it, because otherwise people are going to call you out on it. But then even once you've revealed them, you then have the ability to go, well, I've got a wisdom token. If I go to that location, get the wisdom, I can then augment this one in order to go to that location. There's 
Rather than feeling like you're stuck in your original game plan, you have ways to chop and change, and I like that a lot, because Kingsburg I always felt was a lot more restrictive. And the scores are incredibly tight. This is definitely a plus point I found with this. You get a lot of these games where you end up on like 70 points, 100 points, and somebody would be like 75, 64, and there's like a wide gap between them. And you think, ah, oh, well, whatever, like the points don't matter. Wee do they matter in this. This is, if you've ever played a game called Cooper Island, this is kind of that level of tightness with the scores. Believe it or not, the first game I played with one of the Alley Cat staff, I got 19 and I think they had 15 or 16. And I did exceptionally well to get 19. So 19 is a good score in this game. Think about that. You are going to come down to tiebreakers often in this. And every time you get a victory point or steal a victory point from someone else by taking the monument off them, it makes a difference. You're going to have a very low gap. I don't even think I've seen anybody get above 20 points in this game. So you're talking up to 20 points, somewhere between 10 and 20 is your typical score for this game. If you imagine four or five players getting that kind of score range, yeah, it's gonna get tight. You're gonna want the favor track as that tiebreaker. You're gonna want to really think about on your last, the last round of the game, like, oh, if I get that monument off him, that means they lose a VP, I get a VP, it's a two point swing, it matters. And I really like that. It's about time that we had that kind of tight scoring in some of these games. So as I said, this is a pre-Kickstarter copy and I have not managed to play all the content that this game is gonna offer. The solo mode I've already said, and there will be some expansion module content as well. A way to change up how turn order works, a way to change up what bonuses you get on certain tracks, and one or two other little mini expansions that can be thrown in as well. So there's more content to look out for. But my plays of this have been so far very enjoyable. And I do think, sincerely, that I think this is going to be a Kingsburg killer. If you were to put the two games alongside each other for me, I'd choose this one over Kingsburg any day. Would I play this over Alien Frontiers? In some respects, yes. Alien Frontiers has got a bit more meat to it. There's more involved, it takes longer, and with the expansion, there's definitely a bit more going on. This is definitely a lighter version of a dice placement game, but I feel like we could use a few in the lightweight category. Because a lot of these, like Marco Polo and a few others, are definitely more midweight level for Euros. This is definitely light. Gateway level, probably not quite gateway level, but certainly I would say next step. You know, it wouldn't, you could probably teach this to a brand new gamer depending on their background, but for most I would probably say start off with a proper gateway game and then move on to this. But I really enjoyed it. It looks good, even from a pre-Kickstarter version, it looks good. It was very simple to play, it didn't take too long, it gave me some meaningful choices to make, a decent amount of luck mitigation for a dice placement game. I'm excited to see what this game can bring to the table when it goes live on the Kickstarter. So that's it for me. I would say I would give it about an 8 out of 10 for a current like first impression score. So don't, don't take this as a formal review because I will intend to give this a proper going over when I get a proper release copy in the long run. But yeah, I say give this Kickstarter a look and see if it's something that you would enjoy. So that's it for me on this video. I'll leave you guys to check out the Kickstarter when it launches and when it does, I'll put a link in the description for you. But don't forget to also check out the description for my 5% discount code for zatu.co.uk. You got a gap on your shelf that needs filling with some board games, then I suggest you use the code, go on to Zatu and find the game that's right for you. Until next time, take care and remember as always, it's only a game. Bye for now.